Today's guest on No Edit is someone who became a victim of the Troubles just months before the Good Friday Agreement was signed. Rory Cummins was just 17 when he narrowly escaped gunfire in a Loyalist Volunteer Force attack at the Glengannon Hotel in County Tyrone on December the 27th, 1997. One man was killed, doorman Seamus Dillon, and three others were seriously wounded, including Rory's father, Christy, also a doorman. Christy was left paralysed in the brutal attack, carried out in revenge for the INLA murder of LVF leader Billy Wright just hours earlier. Today, almost 25 years later, Rory and his father, who almost certainly stopped the gunmen from entering the nightclub and crying out a mass shooting, are still fighting for truth and justice. Rory, you're very welcome on today's podcast. Thank you very much, Patricia. There's no doubt that you're still living with what happened that day. It's still very, very raw. You know, as each day goes past, it's still there. The memories are still there. The thoughts are still there. The smells, the visions, everything's still there every single day, you know. And as you get older, I think it gets worse, you know, because you reminisce so much on what could have been, what should have been, and what happened. Going back to the day in question, uh, we had obviously went and visited some family and friends that there day. I was gearing up to DJ that night. I was training to become a professional DJ, so it was. And I had got the 9 o'clock till 11 slot that night in the Glengannon Hotel, which was formerly known as Exit 15, but at the time it was Area 51 then. So I had been full of bees and knees and going around the house and getting my, my vinyl ready and getting to make sure the headphones were working and stuff like that. And I was excited because I was getting a good good slot, you know. But that day my father wasn't meant to work at the Glengannon Hotel and I tortured him, looking at him to take me. And obviously with what happened earlier that day, the family was a bit cautious because of the area itself, you know, because it was only the M1 link and stuff like that there, and local Magashal people, and I suppose you had people from Galbraith and stuff, a lot of different people from different backgrounds, what a mixed and stuff at the at the hotel, you know, and we were quite cautious there could be repercussions for the shooting of Billy Wright that day. But my father, being my father, wanted to do everything he could for us. So we phoned up the head doorman and told him, look, I'm taking Rory across that night. I'll, I'll be my ordinary clothes, but I'll, I'll help out. So that there was fine. So I got totally excited, as you can imagine, a 17-year-old does get in this big slot, 9 to 11, in DJ in Area 51. So we landed at the hotel, and, and things were a bit, bit creepy, you know. The, the lights in the car park weren't fully functioning, and there was a, a police checkpoint at the Black Lock at the primary school as we were going, you know, and it was quite strange. Just there was an eerie feeling just... You know, so I went on ahead a bit of business and I went in and away about, about quarter to nine and I put the needles on the on the, the turntables and stuff and done a bit of a sound check as you do. And I DJ'd away. Everything was fine. My father was at the front door along with Seamus Dillon and along with a few of my uncles and a few other doormen. And come till about five to eleven, eleven I just had finished and handed over to the other DJ and I headed out to the front doors like I always did. I always went out to my father and would ask him for some money until I got paid to go to the KFC that was next door. And just as I was talking to my father and to Seamus Dillon at the time, I happened to spot a Ford, a silver Ford Granada car going round the back with another car in suit. And I said to my father, I says, Daddy, there's a strange car way around the back. And he says, Me, right get you back inside. So just as I was turning, Seamus and Daddy made their way around towards where the cars were and that's whenever all hell broke loose. That's whenever the, the gunman or gunmen began to shoot. The chat Seamus and my father had turned and shouted, get the doors closed. At this stage, there was a doorman lying behind a curb, taking cover. And as I was going in through the door, I noticed that my uncle, Joe Hearn, who is now recently deceased, he was shot just above the heart and there was just pandemonium, pandemonium from all courts. So there was, it seemed like hours and hours, but it wasn't, it was only seconds. And the smell was like fireworks and the noise itself was like bangers that you would have gotten if you were a child growing up, like black cat bangers. That's what it was like, cracking, bang, 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 bang. It seemed as if it go on for a whole eternity. So it did, you know, so... I ran through the hotel 
and I ran into the main lounge and I met a few people and they didn't even realise the shooting had taken place because it was the far side of the hotel and I had been screaming and shouting. So everybody came back out again and I came back out to the car park and there my father was lying and Seamus and my uncle. And then I was also informed then that a 14-year-old glass lifter had been shot with a ricocheted bullet through the leg. You know, and it just was it was horrible. You know, I mean, the scenes was just like something out of a horror movie. You know, and just as, as time went on, you know, my father was lying there in and out of consciousness. There was other guys helping my father, people around Seamus as well, and people around Joe. I had noticed that within minutes of the shooting, people come out of the hedges dressed in black gear and scarves over their faces. To me now, I know who it was. You know, I have no question in my mind that it was the SAS. No doubt in my mind. And whenever you look back on the HET report for, from the Dillon HET report, you'll see there was a, a hide found overlooking the Glengannon Hotel where there was cutouts made in it. There was some rubbish found in it. There was actually army issued camouflage that was traced back to a regiment in Yorkshire or North Yorkshire that never even served in Turon. So my question would be is, how did that camouflage get there? You know, and mm-hmm. it just was ridiculous. You know, that night, just everything just was... It was as if they really wanted my father, my uncle, Seamus, all to die because the police had landed to the scene to close off the scene and stuff. And the ambulance at the Bray of the Hill was held for up to 40 minutes. So it was, it was they wouldn't let the ambulance down because they said it wasn't a safe zone. They still hadn't got everything declared safe. You know, so to me, that, that was a ploy by the RUC and, and the British, whoever who was involved, to make the likes of my father and him was to bleed out and die. 40 minutes and Seamus Dillon did die. Do you know if his death was preventable or has that been a question that's ever been answered or was was his death instant? That That's a question I can't really answer because mm. obviously there's an ongoing inquest, there's an ongoing civil case. I, I can't really answer that question at this present time, but I do know that, that Seamus died later in hospital from his injuries. And my father was saved that night at Dungannon Hospital as well, you know. You saw your father lying, seriously wounded. I mean, what was going through your head as a 17-year-old boy? I, I, I didn't know whether it was real, whether this was actually happening in front of me. You know, it was like it was like something you see in the movies. It really was. It was like the Wild West. People were running around in commotion, the smell of gunfire, the the trauma that people were suffering there and then. You know, I mean, it was that... People were in shock, adrenaline. People were working on adrenaline. You know, it it was it was mad. It was chaotic. Tell me about the aftermath, then, Rory. Your your father was rushed to hospital. When did you have to contact your family, your mother, and and how did that happen? How were they made aware of of what had occurred? I, I had all our family members working in the hotel at the time. And obviously, I hadn't got a mobile phone back then, so there was contact made via through the Glengannon Hotel with family. Tell my family. And I can only imagine what my poor mother and and the rest of my family felt when they got that phone call. You know, I, I, I remember my mother telling me that my brother actually started headbutting the wall, you know, through shock and, and hurt, you know. And it just was, was mental. You know, I mean, eventually we got to Dungannon Hospital and the commotion that was going on. Didn't know why daddy was going to live. Didn't know why she and was going to live or die. We, we knew that my uncle Joe had serious injuries, but they weren't life-threatening. And the wee glass lifter obviously got shot through the leg. And obviously the big concern was the lack of, you know, blood and stuff like that there, you know. But Dr. Painton, I think it was, saved my father's life in Dungan, And he said only my father was so fit and healthy that daddy would have died, you know. You know, daddy lost his body weight and blood, you know. So, you know, I am forever in debt to those those medical staff at South Throne Hospital in Dungan, you know. And unfortunately... She must bear the brunt of it, and he he passed that night, you know. When did you receive the news that Seamus had passed? Was it, you know, immediately? Was it the next day? I I can remember leaving the hospital. Family took me home about, must have been four or five o'clock in the morning from the hospital. I didn't want to leave my mother, you know. And I remember being told that, that, that Seamus had died. And then I was also thinking, well, has daddy died? And they just haven't told me. 
you know, that that was something that was going through my mind as a 17-year-old. Now, I stayed with my my grandmother and my grandfather, God rest them at the time, and they had visitors home from England. So the whole thing was pandemonium, you know, and it was absolutely crazy. And the thoughts of these racing through your mind, you know, you think you're getting a lot of attention, but it's not the attention that you want. When did you find out that your daddy was going to be paralyzed for life? It was, it was quite a while after the shooting. I think it was maybe three, four weeks, maybe even five weeks after the shooting. You know, my, my father was rushed into the Royal Victoria Hospital where they'd done serious operations on my father, you know. And unfortunately, with the operation come consequences, you know. And my father then was obviously left paralyzed. He spent two weeks in intensive care in the Royal and then in the recovery. And he went to Musgrave Park Hospital where then they were told, I'll never forget the phone call that my mother made. I was in the house with my younger brother and a few of my cousins. We were playing snooker in the spare room and I got the phone call. And I didn't know what to make a think of it, you know, because my mother had said, you know, your daddy's moved his big toe. And I, and I sort of questioned, moved his big toe? As in to say, are you having a joke here? Are you taking the piss sort of thing? And then she went on to explain to me, you know, your daddy might never be fit to walk again, blah, blah, blah. But I, I didn't know the extent of the injuries really until I really got going to Musgrave Park Hospital and everything was explained to us, you know. And that's really whenever it really all started kicking in. What were your daddy's injuries? Where was he hit with these bullets and how many times? My father, after Seamus was struck with the bullet, my father had turned to the doorman and shouted to get the doors closed. And he made his way towards the doors to make sure the gunmen couldn't get into the hotel. There was hundreds of people that night in the hotel from all walks of life, all backgrounds. And my father and Seamus didn't put their lives at risk. And unfortunately, as I said before, Seamus died from the result of his injuries. And we were lucky enough that Daddy survived. But Daddy was shot in the back with the bullet. I think it's a dumb dumb bullet with a file off the tops of the bullets. And once the bullet enters the body, it shatters and creates more damage than what it's intended to do. So the bullet entered Daddy's back and came out his shoulder. In the meantime, it had done spinal damage. It had broken ribs, broken Daddy's shoulders and punctured both his lungs. Just exploding inside just, his body? Yeah, yeah. It, it, was like, it was like a cluster, you know, exploded inside his body. So I, I could only imagine how the other victims of this attack, how their injuries were. It, it's just, it's gut-wrenching, you know. When did you first get to see your daddy and speak to him after the shooting? The first time I actually seen daddy was about a week and a half after the shooting when my mother and Emmons asked me, did I want to go and see my father in the intensive care unit in the Royal Victoria Hospital? Now, they explained to me that, you know, your daddy's not wakened, you know, he's just sleeping and out there, which obviously which was good parenting. You know, to me it was, was, was top parenting because... You just could have walked in there and had a real massive breakdown if you weren't told the correct things, you know. And I mean, going into the intensive care ward and there he was lying in sort of like a half tilt in the bed, the tubes in him, drainage tubes coming out of his chest and his, his sides and he had a breathing apparatus and all of And my mother had a damp face cloth and she was wiping his head and holding his hand and talking to daddy and telling daddy that I was here to see him, you know, but my, my father obviously wasn't responsive at this stage. He was in a coma, you know, from his injuries, serious trauma, you know, and it was, it's something that's going to stay with me for the rest of my days, you know, that image, you know, even whenever I look at my father now, I can still see that image and say, thank God he made it, you know. And then he was transferred to Musgrave Park. So it was probably an hour, a week or two after that I got to Musgrave Park and I remember... Daddy saying to us, you know, you know, don't ever get involved in anything. Don't ever, don't let nobody encourage you to do anything after what happened to us and stuff like that. Revenge, revenge. basically. Yeah, you know, my father was quite adamant that there was to be no revenge for anything from anybody for this. That he was doing his job. He was a victim of state collusion, and that's just it with the Middle East LVF. And you know, he encouraged us to, to live a normal life, you know, and, and to not get involved and don't let anybody talk you into doing anything because obviously he was powerless by being in hospital for such a long time. I suppose he, he feared, obviously for us, people trying to, I suppose you would call it grooming us into doing stuff that that he didn't want us to be doing. And obviously tensions must have been high in mid Ulster after that attack. I mean, Billy Wright was murdered in prison by the INLA. 
But what happened at Gungannon was a purely sectarian attack. And that's, that's all it was. And that's all it'll ever be. I mean, there was no justification for it. So, I mean, this area, Mid Ulster, must, the, the tension in it must have been very high, Rory. Really. It's, it's quite scary now as a 42 year old looking back what happened in 1987. You know, you know, there could have been a lot worse happened that night. And thank God that it didn't. There could have been a lot of innocent lives on both sides could have been taken and families destroyed, like the way our family was destroyed. But thank God, as I say, like nothing, there was no big massive repercussions. I know there was a bit of rioting and stuff along Porter Down. There was phone calls made to local hotels about the LVF were going to do this and do that and different things. But thank God none of it really materialised, you know. And thank God that the Good Friday Agreement came about shortly after this shooting. And, And I fully support, you know, the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, as does my father and my family, you know. So as I said, luckily there was no real big massive impacts made on both sides of the community, you know. Better rioting, a few threatening phone calls and things like that there. But as you said, tensions were running, mm-hmm. running very high. And I, as a 17 year old, didn't realise the significance of what was going on, you know. One of the first things that your daddy had said to you as he was lying in his hospital bed was please don't do anything that you know I mean, don't get involved in power militaries, don't take revenge. I mean, that says a lot about him. When did he find out that he wouldn't be able to walk again? I think I think really, realistically, I think it was like a, a few months after he was on Musgrave Park when they'd done all sorts of surgery and done all sorts of tests and different things and all, you know. It, his body would be taking a lot of spasm, you know, where his leg would move and his feet would move and different things. And we were getting hope, thinking that this was him able to move, you know. But... In the real world, it wasn't. It just there was too much damage done, and that was just it, you know. And it was difficult. It was difficult as a family to take because my father was such an active man. He was involved with the local GA. He was actually was a youth officer, and he was involved with two or three local boxing clubs, cross community boxing clubs and stuff. And he'd come home from work and play football. Was there getting dinner? He'd come home and played a bit of football. Was he went out for a run? He was a very healthy, active man. Never drank, never smoked. Really family oriented, you know. To be struck down in his prime, it was quite sad. And was it your mother that had to give him that news or was it the doctors or what way was that put to him? I, I'm not 100% sure, not there, Patricia, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would assume that, 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 that the consultants and the doctors would have spoke to mummy and daddy together as a family, maybe brief mummy first. I, I don't know, I can only assume in that there. Again, I was too young to be, to yeah. be involved in that sort of... As your daddy has went through his life... How has he coped with being paralysed? Well, I'll take you back till 1979. So just before I was yeah. born, uh, my father worked for a local farmer called Bobby Sloan, who was a Protestant man, you know, and gave mm-hmm. Daddy an opportunity to work on the farm. And Daddy was quite a good worker from, from my remembrance from whenever I was younger and he worked, you know. And Daddy was arrested on the farm by two open top loads of British Army and was asked his name and they took him to golf barracks and there he was officially arrested you know there was no police known to hand to arrest my father to start off with which was quite strange so my father was arrested for a hoax bomb and membership of a prescribed organization and he appealed it and first of all he got 16 years for the hoax bomb and he appealed it and he got 12 years in the court of appeal so it was appealed it was given a lesser sentence the judge actually said in the deposits I can't overrule a higher judge, so I'll knock four years off it. So that there's fine. And then he got done for membership prescribed organization. He got 12, he got the full whack, he got 12 years for that there. But daddy served six years in prison. He spent the first three and a half to four years of it on the blanket protest in, in the cages, you know. So that was difficult as a family. And I hadn't been born at this stage. My mother was only like three, four months pregnant with me. So I was born into the troubles, you know what I mean? With, with trauma and with, with the conflict on my hands, you know, as a child. And I remember going to visit my father in prison. And I remember bringing out the wee parcels. There was a tin of juice and a bag of farmer brown crisps I keep talking about. And then, lo and behold, one day I was sitting in primary school, eating my dinner. Pete who was in St. Mary's in Stewartstown. And my father came in. And to this very day, that's the most happiest moment of my life, bar the birth of me and kids. And it's still so vivid. The memory's still there. It was I was delighted. So my father came out of prison, was never involved in 
anything. The police were never even at our door, ever, not once. Daddy Lee led a very clean, clear sort of life, you know, family man. He went to work in a factory called Power Screen at the time, and then obviously things got tight and they were laid off. So he had to go to the doors to do door work, you know, to provide for us, to provide for his family. You know, so Daddy was quite a family man, quite active, physically and mentally. He was a great sportsman and got involved with the community, you know. He was just brilliant and still is to this very day brilliant, you know. So that, that's my memories of my father, you know, growing up. And the, the arrest for IRA membership and then the hoax bomb, that is part of an ongoing case that your father has to have it quashed because your father denies ever being a member of the IRA. He denies ever being involved in this hoax bomb. And I think your legal team have built a very strong case against that. There's a there's an ongoing case at the moment with the CCRC sitting over in England with the depositions and stuff to do with Daddy, say, statements. Daddy never made no statements. He never signed no statements. Here's, that was a confession. It was a confession, right? right? So... He's always said to us <clears throat> growing up that, that he never done what he was charged for. He never was involved with what he was charged for. And he kept telling us and telling us for years. So we decided then to take a case with KRW Law, who have been absolutely fabulous with, with Daddy, you know. And we, we got all the papers together and got everything together. And they said, look, this is the case we want. So we went on ahead and pursued it. The case is now sitting about five years with the CCRC. Daddy denies being involved in a hoax bomb. And he has also asked for, can he see the photographs of this hoax bomb? Can he see the forensics of this hoax bomb? Can he see photographs of this hoax bomb? They can't produce nothing. And Daddy's documents, we got a letter back in the early 90s that said everything belonging to Daddy was destroyed in Gulf Barracks through asbestos contamination. So if Daddy's documents were destroyed through asbestos contamination, what are they testing? But I do know that the CCRC have written back 10 months ago, it was last September, to say that they had been seeking a specialist in the pacing and the confessions and the timing and the stuff like that there in the deposits or whatever it is they're testing to try and get this case overturned. They say they're using the same expert that they used before that brought a case in front of the court and it was quashed. So that alone stands testament to our case. It says that they want to get the same expert to get this case overturned. You know, and Daddy has always stated that his innocence, and that speaks a lot for a man that served time in prison, was accused of all sorts, and was shot by the middle of VF to still proclaim his innocence and fight publicly for his innocence. It speaks, speaks testament to the man, you know, and his character. We hear a lot of, I mean, from the loyalists say that, that the reason the hotel was targeted because there was IRA men doing the door, but, I mean, even in the HET report, I think it was said that it was a, a purely sectarian attack and the targets weren't the doormen because, actually, your daddy stopped the gunmen from going inside the hotel. Yes, my my father and Seamus, you know, I can't forget about Seamus because Seamus sacrificed his life to save hundreds of other lives. And my father sacrificed his basic human rights to, and living to, to save hundreds of other lives, you know what I mean? Uh, I was subject as well of that attempted murder bid. And I, I was fortunate enough that I, that I wasn't hit with any of those bullets because they just spread the place. I was very, very fortunate, you know. And and as you said before, like, there was nobody named. There was no specific targets named. It didn't say we're going after Seamus Dillon or we're going after Christopher Cummings or Joe Hearn or that young fella, Carolyn, that was shot. It just was kill as many as, as they could and hope for the best. That's what it was. It just was was like a happy air for them. It just was like, let's go out and let's do as much damage as we can. And thank God they didn't do the damage that they set out to do. Yes, they caused a lot of damage, hurt and pain, and there was loss of life, but they didn't achieve really what they set out to do. It's frightening to think of what could have happened. I mean, what happened was bad enough, but to think what could have happened... Had those gunmen got inside that nightclub, it, it just doesn't bear thinking about. When, Rory, did you start to turn your attention to getting truth and justice over what happened that night? Because from the get-go, your family and other victims would say was that there wasn't a proper police investigation into Glengannon. 
I, I strongly contest that there was never a proper full investigation into the, the attack at the Glengan Hotel. I, I happened to be up Cookstown Street where I live and I happened to call into my local solicitor one day. I, I just, my mind was playing on me about what had happened, what had happened because for years my mother and father were turned away from a solicitor in Dungannon to say, it is, oh, we've had no word back, no word back. I don't think you've got a case. Don't think you've got a case. And this went on for years and then I, I, I sort of, took a head stagger, if you like, and went to see my local solicitor. And he pointed me in the direction of KRW. So we met up with KRW and put all the stuff to the table to them. And they were quite interested in the case. And then Pandora's box started open, if you want to put it that road. And then me being me, being an overthinker, I, I started poking and probing and going on. And the more I poked and the more I probed, the more I found. You know, and growing up, as a 17-year-old, I, I was still at school. I was at Holy Trinity College here in Cookstown, still at school. And growing up as as a young teenager, sorry, coming towards the end of my teenager years, you know, and you sort of think, well, these things happen. You know what I mean? Just get on with it. For years, that, that, that was my mentality. It just happened. That's it. We'll have to deal with it. But then as you started realizing that your basic human rights and your, your right to truth and justice and different things, then I, and then I started seeing all our families and they were going, you know, probing into things and stuff. And I thought, well, hold on here a second. Let's just go and see what if. And what if was turned into legal cases, you know. And how did the attack impact you immediately after and in the long term? Because there, I've no doubt that you suffered immensely, even though you didn't get hit by a bullet. You normally miss being hit by bullets, but... How, how did that impact you? Well, as I said there previously, like I was still at school, you know, and the teachers at the school were very, very good, you know, especially my PE teacher, you know, Mr. Canavan, you know, he was very, very forthcoming, very, very supportive, you know, and I had a few good friends at the school at the time, you know, and, and the lads were pretty good, you know. So everything was fine, really, until until Daddy was set to come home from the hospital, you know, because we sort of, people were making a fuss around me and my brother and stuff and that there, you know, and we, we sort of, we sort of thought this this was good at the time. We sort of thought, you know, you know, we're getting takeaways, you know, we're getting took here and took there, and we're getting this and that there. But then, when reality actually kicked in, when my father come home in his chair, and he was all bloated and stuff like that, and it just then reality really kicked in. And there's no point telling that I, I used quite a bit of alcohol in my younger years, from nineteen uproots right right up to my late twenties. I used a lot of alcohol to mask what happened, and I couldn't get the right help at the time. And it's only really since I hit me, my mid-30s to, to now to my early 40s that I've been seeking the correct professional help and I was recently diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's a blessing that I was diagnosed with because now I know how to sort of cope with things and, and, and coping mechanisms and things like that there. And it was difficult. It really was very, very difficult. You know what I mean? The people around me suffered because of my behaviours. But now that I look back on it, those behaviours related back to the shooting. You know, not that this is a blame game or anything. You know, I, mean, I, I, I take full responsibility for my actions as, as a younger man, you know. But when you look back at it, things could have been a lot different and should have been a lot different only for that, that cold night, you know. We knew from the outset that the LVF were involved. There was a number of gunmen that night. I mean, what have you found that you can say uh, that the RUC failed to tell you about that night? Well, first and foremost, myself and my father had never been interviewed by the RUC or PSNI regarding the shooting. And to me, that's a critical fault straight away. The RUC never took a statement from you or your father? Never took a statement from you or my father. I remember Special Branch coming to the hospital to my father in Musgrave, two men came into the room and my father was petrified. He pulled the sheets up and went into a cold sweat. He thought they were coming to finish him off. The only thing they asked my father that time was, do you know anything what happened that night? And daddy answered no. And they left. And my experience of, of anybody coming to the house was the RUC. It was somebody from the security team come out to me and my mother and they handed us a, a, a bar chain for the front door for personal security. Bar chain. A bar chain for our personal security. You know, that's the only interaction I ever had with police over, and, and my father too, you know. But the unfortunate thing is there was these typed up statements that were generated in Sea Park to say that me and my father had made these statements, but they were typed up, and my legal team has asked 
and they have asked could they have the original handwritten statements, where they were taken, who they were taken from, they can't get them. So you're saying, Marie, that the REC has two type statements from you and your father about what happened that night, but you you can never recall the REC taking statements? So I, I can categorically now tell you that we never interacted with the RUC statement-wise. There was no statements ever taken. Even whenever you look at the statements, they're, they're near enough identical, only with a few wee bits and pieces. You know, And at the time of the statement, the time of the, the so-called statement that Daddy made, Daddy was in Musgrave Park Hospital. This was February 98. Daddy was in Musgrave Park Hospital, severely sick. So he couldn't have been able to give a statement? No. No, he wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been physically or mentally fit to give a statement to start off with. And plus, I was still a minor when my statement was so called taken. I never had a solicitor present. I never had no one present. So these statements never happened. And when were these statements said to have been recorded? Were there dates? And I mean, when did you find out about these type statements? On the type statements, there was dates. Daddy's was February ninety eight, and mine was March ninety eight. Now I didn't turn eighteen till March ninety eight, but this was taken before my eighteenth birthday. These statements were generated back in two thousand and thirteen in Sea Park. Uh, the legal team has them, you know. Uh, they were uh, reproduced they were, in two thousand thirteen. They were reproduced because there was a there was a few questions asked regarding stuff that was being moved from Sea Park to Hollywood for safe, secure reasons. Hollywood would be MI5 MI, headquarters then. M- MI5 headquarters, you know, and the CCRC actually come across some of the stuff as well. Right. You know, that was being moved, and they've questioned why it's been moved. Why do you believe anything would be moved from Sea Park? Are, do you mean evidence? Because that's where a lot of evidence would be held. Yes, I I believe physical evidence from the night in question uh, one example is my father's clothes. I've been fighting a campaign now for four years with the PSNI and with the coroner to obtain my father's clothes that, that he wore that night, that he was shot. The PSNI has rigorously told us, you're not getting them back. So my legal team then took another route and went to the coroner. And the coroner says that the clothes are of no more use, that they should be handed back to the family Immediately. So we thought, here we go, we're going to get something. Till this very day, the PSNI are still refusing to hand back the clothes. The question is, why are they refusing to hand it back? What are they going to use this for? You know, because... There's no need to have them anymore, basically, is what you're saying. So why will they not return your daddy's clothes? This is a question that they won't answer to me or to my legal team. Why they won't return them. They're saying it's because there's an ongoing inquest, there's an ongoing this. But the coroner has directed that they should be they should be returned. Back. You know, the police keep saying about the ongoing inquest and stuff. Well I I can tell you now and confirm to you now that myself or my father was never ever asked to the original inquest of the Dillons. Now my father was next to Seamus Dillon and he was shot and I seen everything that happened too. So I would be classed as a key witness. Never ever have we been asked. When was Seamus Dillon's inquest? I, I'm not 100% sure in the dates on the inquest, but I do know that there's a, a new inquest coming up now this August, and we're still not asked to You still inquest. haven't been asked? Still haven't been asked. Did. Which is quite strange. You know, begs the question, why have we not been asked? What are they afraid of? You said quite openly, Rory, that you believe there was collusion in the attack on Glengannon, the attempt on your dad's life. And Seamus Stillen's murder. Why do you believe that? For years, I, d- I didn't really know much about it. But when I sat down and started putting the pieces of the puzzle together, with the men coming out of the hedges, dressed in dark combat gear and scarves over their faces, the police holding the ambulance on the hill, the silver Ford Granada, which I believe, personally, was a police car, took the red Vauxhall Nova in, a safe passage in, a safe passage out, the police checkpoint at the Black Lock prior to us going. I also know now, through another witness of the, the, the shooting, that there was a police checkpoint on the old Dungan Moy Road that night heading into the Glengannon as well. And it's it's just, it's got collusion written all over it, so it has. They, they hide overlooking the Glengannon where the bushes were all trimmed back so they could see clearly where the Glengannon was. It, it, it has the handprints 
of collusion all over it. I've read the HET report into Seamus Dillon's murder and there were a few things that, that cropped up and that included trainers that had DNA on them and the forensics who had investigated and looked into the trainers and said that almost certainly there's a DNA profile there. But am I right in saying that that was never acted on? You are correct, Patricia, on what you say there. They, they were able to match the trainer to be the regular wearer of Suspect 1. Suspect 1 is still running the streets. You know, obviously, you- obviously I can't name who Suspect 1 is. I know who Suspect 1 is. There was a number of suspects named in this HET report. There was report. five, six, seven, eight suspects. But suspect one is mentioned regularly. Yeah. At at the scene of the burned out car, I think it's Mockerboy or Lockerboy Lane, there was a bank yard found. There was overalls found. A bank card? A bank yard. With a name on it, I, obviously. I, I don't know if a name was on it. It was mentioned in the report. There was a number of items found, but they were destroyed because they were of no use. Now, to me, that stinks of cover-up and collusion for what happened. Rory, it also says in the HET report into Seamus Dillon's murder that ballistic reports linked one of the firearms used in Glengannon to two other murders in the early 90s in Lurgan and a non-fatal shooting in Portadown in August 1997. That's just a few months before Glengannon. The report stated, whilst this linkage is extremely important information to investigators, it is limited in that although it links weapons to other crimes, it does not necessarily implicate individuals. This is because paramilitary groups held their illegal weapons in pools or armories under the control of a quartermaster. Do you find it hard to believe that, I mean... With that sort of information, that a, a gunman couldn't be arrested? It, it, it beggars the belief, you know what I mean, that, that somebody couldn't be arrested. Surely there's bound to be residue. Surely there's bound to be some sort of prints, some sort of forensic evidence to link these, these gunmen or women, you know. It's, it's a hard one to take, you know, and, and I do know that, that one of the, the weapons and the shooter and someone who else was involved in her, her attack was involved with, with a murder of a, of a council worker in Portadown as well, you know. Adrian Lamp. Adrian Lamp was, was, was murdered by one of the suspects in, in, in hers. And the female involved was also co-herded, recorded by MI5, gloating about her role in the murder of Seamus Dillon and about the, the handling of the weapon. She was later arrested in England. She'd done some time, but then she was let out. It was it was quashed. Is there a possibility, Rory, that you know the the investigation, the field investigation, and everything surrounding Ben Gannon and what happened was just police incompetence, and and there was no collusion? Well, that's quite a good question because my answer to that would be that you couldn't rule that out, but at the same time, when you look at all the other mitigating factors coming out. They hide overlooking the hotel. The army issued camouflage that was traced back to a regiment in Yorkshire where they never served in Tyrone. When you look back at the police checkpoints at the Black Lock, the old Ungen Moy Road, you look back at the, the police holding the ambulance at the top of the hill, you look back at the police car bringing in the LVF that night, and whenever you look back about the men coming out of the hedges and stuff, in my eyes, it's full, full blown collusion. But at the same time, I can understand what you're saying about police's incompetence to, to do a full, thorough investigation because I do know that in one of the statements that there was a map shown to witnesses and they had a mark on the map where they were at. But if you go and look at this map, I know at least six people that haven't marked that map and myself and my father's two of them. So to me, police incompetence, 100%. Collusion, 100 million percent. I am so sure on it. As you began to find out these things, and I mean it was piece by piece that you found these things out, was it overwhelming? It's it's a lot to process. 
So it is. I, I have a younger brother and a younger sister and my mother, and I tend not to involve them too much because we have suffered enough, you know. And as I said, I carry the burden of a cross on my back for taking my father out of our family home that night to the Glingyan when he didn't have to be there. And I I feel, and I'll always feel like this, no matter who tells me different, that it was my fault that my father was shot and that my family has lost. My brother, my sister, my mother and the wider family have lost a, a man who was in his prime. Now, other people will tell you it was meant to happen, blah, blah, blah. But I don't buy that. I, I believe that it was my fault that I took my father out. It could have been somebody else could have been shot that night. Maybe that's selfish, but that's how I feel. And to this very day, it's quite overwhelming because I, I deal with quite a lot of this legal stuff for my father, for my family and for myself. There's a lot of information, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. But I must say the support that I get, even from yourself there, Patricia, and from other victims' families on both sides of the debate is immense. And only without us victims opening up and speaking to each other, it will be a lot worse. That's what trauma has done to you, to make you feel like guilt, which shouldn't be there. I mean, the only people that should be feeling guilty is the people that went out that night with with guns. There is a small number of critics of collusion that say it doesn't exist. How, How would you respond to that? I think they need to give themselves a good shake and come into the real world. Collusion just didn't happen on the Catholic, Nationalist or Republican side. It happened on the Protestant, Unionist and Loyalist side too. Both communities were used as pawns in the dirty war. You know, collusion happened on both sides and it's still happening to this very day. You know, collusion is not an illusion, as we keep saying. It's it's reality. It's happening. People need to take a step back and take a reality check. You know, there's been recent cases where a police ombudsman has said collusive behaviour. Well, that's the input in the legal way of saying there was collusion. It's not they're saying, oh, we suspect collusive behaviour. It's collusion. Collusion is collusion. What exactly is collusive behaviour? Is it either collusion or is it not? I think a lot of these people in the powers to be want to cover themselves to make sure they're not left open for scrutiny from both sides of the community, you know, or both political aspects or, or from the governments, you know. So I think they use those words, those fancy words to try and deter from what really is going on. Take me forward, Rory, to what the legal fight has been like since the day you walked into KRW's office. What has happened? What's going on? What do you hope for? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to start and say that that the support, the advice, the advocacy that KRW has given myself and my family has been second to none. It's been absolutely brilliant. You know I mean? They've been top class. Uh, the fight... At the start, you think, oh, my God, is this really happening? You know what I mean? You think, but do we really have a case? And then when you sit down with your legal team, your barristers, senior counsel, junior counsel, and they start showing the details, and they start showing the facts and the figures, then it becomes reality. And then you're waiting on court dates, and then you're not back. And then you're hitting with court dates, and then you're not back again. And then whenever you do get into court, you're like two steps forward and one step back. But I feel... Our case and a series of mid cases, we have really come to the forefront as last while. I do know that we're listed for a case now in September, early October, which will be monumental. Yes. Could you just describe that for anybody listening, what that case is about? It's a group of uh, families in mid who were affected by uh, loyalist paramilitary activity, uh, lost loved ones, were, were victims of attacks during the Troubles. I can't really go into too much specifics about it because obviously it's a legal situation. But what I will say is that there's been a number of families that's been affected by the same, the same guns, the same shooters, the same handlers, the ballistics, everything's there. You know, it matches up a number of families together, you know. So there's a civil action going on there in September and October time. And there's a lot of sensitive and non-sensitive materials that's being sifted through by our legal team, which, which I can't. So this case is against the state. This is against the state, yes. So that's going on. Personally, for you as a family, what legal cases have you got going on? Personally, I have a civil case. And then I have a Twitter case going on at the minute myself where I had to take a legal action against an account, stroke accounts, 
that labelled me on the 31st of December 2021, labelled me personally as a convicted provisional IRA gunman on a public forum. I corrected the account in question and told him, no, you must have the wrong person. I was never convicted. I never have been involved. As a matter of fact, I've never been in prison. They even went on ahead to question that. They had tagged other, what I would call, influenced people within their within this conversation. So I had to take action and I had to go to my legal team and I brought all the evidence to my legal team and we decided then it's time to take a case against this individual or individuals and Twitter. Again, it's a live case at the minute, so it is. It's already been in court a few times, so it has. It's closing, near enough, it's coming to a closing stage. Uh, all I can say is that people should be careful with the post online because there's repercussions for, in the, for your actions, you know. And I think it's quite sad that you're fighting for justice and and there are people, mostly anonymous, faceless trolls who attempt to justify what happened to you, what happened to your daddy, by by just lies. And, I mean, as being someone who has suffered a troll in the past, I mean, I've even had people justify rape threats to my children. Um, and it's disgusting. It's traumatizing. And you just wonder what planet these people live on, that they think they can say those things to another human being and... And get away with it. I mean, it's it's a long time coming that action is uh, is taken against these people. It's very very difficult to, to take action against these people. So it is, you know. But you know, as, as I've said before, and I've said it on a public platform before, I don't mind a bit of back and forth, a bit of bit of whatever he said, she said, sort of thing. But when you actually publicly name somebody as a convicted provisional IRA gunman, and when you were told that. That has never happened publicly as well, and you still continue to question it. And then to come on ahead and question about, is it because I was upset that I wasn't going to get a victim's pension because I was a perfected IRA gunman? I have never been to prison for any terrorism act or any terrorism-related activities. I have never been involved in any paramilitaries whatsoever. So I haven't. So leading on from that there, a few months later, I had a rap on the door. I went to my door, it was a PSNI. PSNI come in, I, I unveiled them into my home, and I said, how can I help you? And they say, you're X, Y, and Z. And I says, yes. And we are led to believe this is your Twitter handle. And I says, yes, it is. And they said, well, we've been sent out to let you know that we've got intelligence on your account. And I said, right. First thing, I was in shock straight away. Second thing, I says, am I committing a crime? The police officer looked at the other police officer and the them sort of shrugged their shoulders slightly and says, no, but we've been sent out by our boss to let you know. Just be careful what you post online. So I turn around and I says, I says, hi boys, expect a phone call from my solicitor in the next five or ten minutes. And lo and behold, my solicitor did phone them within the five or ten minutes. And even he was shocked because the policemen didn't really know what they were being sent out for. So these two police officers have been sent to my home, in my eyes and in my view, to intimidate me. But what I want to know is what intelligence have they been gathering and who has been given the intelligence and what has the intelligence been used for? So my legal team then got on to the police officer that was in charge of these two men and he wouldn't make no comment. He wouldn't make none. He said he was he was in touch with the LIB, which is the legacy investigation branch. So this popped up so many questions in. So, my so in a nutshell there, Ray, you, the police called your home to warn you off from posting what on Twitter? What was it? What was the tweets that, that had concerned the police so much? They didn't say. Because I, I assume had you committed a criminal offence, you would have been arrested. Well, that's why I asked the police there and then. I says, have I committed a crime? And they said, no, no, no. The two police officers looked at each other and sort of shrugged their shoulders a bit as if I say, you know, don't blame us. We've been sent out here to do this by somebody who's more superior than them, you know. So I don't blame the two police officers that come out to my home. You know what I mean? They were no. more than accommodating. and they were dead on. But the question is, the man in charge or the woman in charge of those two police officers, what information were they obtaining or receiving? Were they felt the need to go to LIB 
and they also felt the need to send out two officers, in my eyes, wasting police time, wasting public services, wasting public money, to tell me something that I wasn't even committing a crime. What were you posting about? You don't have to say specifically, but would it be in relation to your case that you were posting? I, I have posted quite a bit regarding the case. Now, I have never named anybody individually. I've always used clippings and cuttings and stuff that's already out in the public domain. You know, that's already there as fact and everything else, you know. So maybe maybe I've spooked someone that, that shouldn't have been spooked. Maybe they fear the truth. Maybe they fear the truth going out there. But leading but leading on from that has now left me in a position where we had to go to the police ombudsman of Northern Ireland to lodge a complaint and a report and it's now under active investigation. investigation. You know, so I, I, I look forward to the outcome out there, you know, and I think this is quite I think someone's tried to either smear my campaign or put the fear into me. Because you run your Twitter handle under the name Glengannon Truth and Justice. It's yeah. a campaign account. Yeah. For, for getting truth and justice over 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 that attack, how how have you coped with trolling, Rory? Because I mean, sadly, a lot of victims do do get trolled on Twitter. How, what's your coping mechanism with that? After things got hot and heavy a few times, and different things out there, and different victims groups, and different victims, and and different people within. Public services, things were getting a bit hot and heavy, you know. I, I sort of back, backed off a wee bit, took a bit of time out, you know, from, from online and stuff because let's face it, like, you know, it's, it's online. Anybody can sit in a room online and make threats and make different things out there. But, you know, your real life is what's happening around you every day. So you sort of have to take a break from out there, you know, and get yourself mentally prepared again to go, to go again and, and to see what's going on. I, I, I use the Twitter handle Truth and Justice Glengan 97 because that's me. That's me. That, that that's not a campaign by four or five families. That's me. You know, what I mean, I made this quite clear to other trolls. It's me. This this me personally. This is what I'm using. You know, and I've been made fun of. You know, so it's difficult. It is difficult. But going on from that, from that situation, from being trolled and having to take legal action, where it's now in court, it's on a very advanced stage. To the police calling out to my home, till only a couple of weeks ago. A fella made death threats to me with a with a flick knife. This was actually in the street? In in my housing development, yes. Someone came into your housing development with a knife? Who, yes. Did you know this individual? I, I know who the individual is. No? No. Or did you know I, him prior I, I, to this? I didn't know him prior to this, but yeah. on the evening in question, he had a snood pulled over his face and a pair of dark sunglasses and a hood pulled up, shouting absurd things about my father, about my father being shot and that he was going to shoot me and that he was going to kill me. And lo and behold, then we restrained the fella. So we did. We got him restrained and the police had come and got the knife and all of him. And at the minute, he said he was sent by very scary people that you don't want to F and mess with. And that he was told that if he come to my house that nothing would happen to him by these people. And he admitted on a, on a, on a mobile phone recording that, that he was sent by paramilitaries. Now, how true that is, I don't know, but I can't take a risk for myself or my family. So at the minute, that's under an active investigation. And, and do you track Lee Linkless to your campaign work around Glengannon? Well, it's a bit of a coincidence that on the 31st of December, I was labelled a, a convicted PIRA gunman. Then the police called to my house a few few months later. And then this, all in the space of seven months. You know, you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, it starts joining, you know. So to me, I would like to say to all the trolls out there, be careful what you're trolling people. Be careful what you're saying because there's actions at the end of it and someone could end up getting hurt. Like I could have been stabbed to death, you know, or a family member that could have been at my home could have been stabbed to death. How are you, how you coping with that, Ray? Because that, that's only ha- happened in the last, I think, few weeks. Two and a half, three weeks ago it's happened. You know, it's it's quite difficult, you know. You know, I'm quite vigilant, you know, and my first and foremost is the safety of my, of my children my family, you know, that's first and foremost, and my safety. You know, I, I, I do regular checks around my home and stuff like that there to make sure everything's safe and sound, you know, but I do know that the person and persons in question have been bailed with conditions that they can't enter my housing development or they can't make direct or indirect contact with me. But what concerns me the most is, regarding the fellow that, that made the death threats with the knife, is that he was handed over to a local police station and they bailed him out. 
people have went down the road for less. How is your faith in the justice system and in the police? Is it? I mean, is is there any faith there whatsoever? Because I know you, you have said, like, I mean, there has been police that have come out, out your house, they've been helpful, but has this kind of damaged your faith beyond repair? Or I wouldn't say it's damaged the beyond repair. I, I do believe that regardless in what occupation you have in life, there's always going to be good and bad on both sides. It was the same with the conflict. It was good and bad on both sides, you know, and we can't take that away. I do know that there's, there's police out there that will bend over backwards and help you get whatever you need to be done out there. And you'll investigate an officer regarding the fellow that pulled the knife. He's been very thorough and very, very good. The community policing team have been very, very good. But, and again I'll say but, there is quite a lot of corruption within the forces, you know, and uh, it's 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 a hard one to to decide on. I, I have my own thoughts on what I think of, of these services. I, I have my own ideas. After going through what I've went through with, with state air collusion and, and RUC and stuff involved and all, I, I really don't think much has changed. That's my own personal opinion and nobody can take that away from me. Do you ever believe that you'll get truth and justice over what happened that night? I don't think we will ever get closure. I do think while the book's open, we might close a few chapters, but we'll never get the full novel closed. I don't think we'll ever see the suspects named ever stand trial for what they've done. And a big part of that is to do with this amnesty that that Boris Johnson and his government have brought in and the likes of Johnny Mercer, who's backing it and stuff like that there. You know I mean, but to me, that's just covering up the war crimes, you know, and it's depriving families on both sides of the divide, Catholic, Protestant, whatever you want, Loyalist, Republican. It's denying those families truth and justice too. There's a lot of service personnel, innocent service personnel too, that died in the conflict and stuff. So those people will never get closure either, you know, and it's quite sad. And I think the excuse that the PSNI and, and all the different branches are using is that constraints about resources, resources, resources. Well, why don't they just do the thing and do it right? Hand over the files. Whether people want to see it or not. Let Whether people think it's sensitive or non-sensitive, hand the stuff over. Let people get some sort of closure. How can we get peace and reconciliation and closure on the island of Ireland when we can't even get basic disclosure and a basic human right to truth and justice? And I, and I would urge anybody regardless where you come from, a loyalist background or a Republican background or a service personnel, fight and fight hard. If you believe that you can get truth and justice, fight and fight hard for it. Never give up. <laughs>